So welcome to the very first Ask a Developer segment for the Spawncast Patreon. And uh, for those people that are joining for the first time that are not familiar with this episode, basically you guys submit questions that you want a developer to answer and I'll be more than happy to respond to them as I can. Now, some questions may kind of be NDA specific, so I won't be able to answer. And in that scenario, I will respectfully just you know, let you guys know that it's an NDA question and I'm not able to respond to that. But we do have a list of questions here that have been submitted and I'm going to go through them today and answer them all because they're all very, very good questions. But let's go ahead and get started. So the first one is from YB and he asks, it's common knowledge that video games are taking longer to make, however big the studio or budget behind them. What are the parts of this process that takes up the most time today? Which parts do you think will get faster with all the progress in AI and with better tooling? Which ones do you think will continue to be slow in the future? Well, this is a a very, very good question. And I will say that I am not a AAA developer. So some of the things that I'm going to say may not kind of translate into the world of AAA game development, but I am a game developer and I'm certainly aware of the bottlenecks that come along the way when it comes to making games. I would say in general, the the longest part of the process is really just the kind of the development work or the production work itself that goes on. And depending on the scope of the game, obviously that means that your production time can be significantly increased as well. I think as far as AI, that is a very good question. And it's one of those topics where a lot of people have a lot of resistance to when we start talking about AI in games, because the initial thought is that when you start thinking about things like AI in video game development, then it's eliminating jobs. And a lot of people certainly don't want to, to, you know, be out of a job, you know, in favor of an AI replacing what they're doing. However, there is what is known as kind of ethical AI, which is something that I'm hearing a lot more about in the industry. And it's basically introducing AI to assist with the development times. Now, will AI make development times faster? I think in in theory, that is the case. It probably will. However, I think overall, we're just going to continue to see development times of video games continue just to increase in scope. I mean, we already got a taste of what The Last of Us Part 2 had cost and Horizon Forbidden West in excess of $200 million each. That's kind of the money that we're looking at with AAA game development and the number of years it takes to make these games. So I do think that AI will definitely assist in some areas, but in general, I think development time isn't really going to change much. And I think the biggest, I don't don't want to call it a bottleneck because it's definitely some part of the game development life cycle that is extremely important. But QA is, I think, is the part that is always going to be taking a long time to do. We've seen a game like Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. They basically took, you know, the last year off to just polish and test the game. And that's something that I think a lot of studios don't have the luxury to do. Nintendo obviously did with Tears of the Kingdom. But the QA process, while you can automate that process, there are automated QA tools that can basically run through a scenario of tests for you. Nothing beats kind of just kind of traditional real world testing with with testers that uh, basically their job is to break the game. So I think overall, look, video game development is is long and it's only going to get longer as we kind of continue to advance generations. Good question, by the way. Now, the next question is from DJ Fat Cat, and he asks, when starting out with zero coding experience and you want to make an RPG, should I start with RPG Maker or learn something like Unity? Now this, again, this is a good question. I get asked this question a lot about where do I start when it comes to making video games? Look, there are a lot of different engines and tools out there that you can use. There's 2D kind of engines like Game Maker, RPG Maker, and then there's obviously something like Unity, which allows you to pretty much make whatever you want, but the sandbox to build those games is you know, is a lot bigger and the learning curve is, is bigger as well. I personally think that if you want to make an RPG, then RPG Maker is the ideal way to start. Now, obviously there are limitations with what you can do with RPG Maker, 
but if you have zero coding experience and i think learning rpg maker and learning kind of the systems that go along with building an rpg would be an ideal choice so i, I recommend rpg maker but i would also say uh, dc fat cat if you are kind of finding it too simple or you think it's kind of too simplified for your needs then don't be afraid to you know pivot over to something like unity because that is obviously a very very popular tool for making uh, games as well now the next question is from christopher matthews investing time into developing high-end graphics seems to be diminishing returns as more powerful hardware comes along and we see smaller and smaller differences in the visual appearances of new games why is it that we don't see developers outside of the indie scene make games that look like say ps2 or ps3 games and use the rest of the budget to infuse the games with more high quality and meaningful content this is a fantastic question I think the the best way I can answer that is when we talk about AAA game development, there is a certain standard, there is a certain kind of bar that needs to be, uh, you know, overcome, you know, if if you will. I think gamers are expecting a lot more these days from visuals because we've seen some fantastic games that have fantastic visuals. So it's it's very apparent when a AAA game has graphics that don't look you know like they should or they look like previous generation games and they kind of get often get criticized for it which i think is a little bit unfair because there are some very very good games triple a games out there that have graphics that aren't of the quality that people expect and they do look like you know xbox 360 or ps3 style games and i think you know like i said they, they often get criticized unfairly i think ultimately it's really about giving the best experience to the gamer and in a lot of ways graphics is kind of the first thing that that people kind of connect with you know if you see five seconds of a video game the first thing that you're going to look at is the aesthetics how it looks the the graphical style of that game and if it if it pops if it looks good then you've kind of hooked that person in they want to know more about the game so i think unfortunately while i do agree with with what you're saying christopher I think graphics is is something that is is going to continue to iterate and just kind of look better as as we go through generations now obviously that does have an effect on other parts of the game such as performance but i think that whole concept of you know reducing the graphical fidelity of a game just to kind of allow for other parts of the games or or do do more with different systems inside the game is not really anything that a lot of AAA game developers are really interested in doing. Next question is from Aaron Wilson. When developing for the Nintendo Switch, how does the Switch aspect work? Do you need to factor that in? Do you need to render the game at both 720p and 1080p for handheld and docked? Or is this something the hardware does automatically? Does this make developing for the Switch harder than other consoles? This, this is a fantastic question. When I first started making Switch games, this was one of the first kind of questions I had in my head about how does this actually all work? And the answer to that is you have to, you have to account for both. So in other words, you can't kind of hardwire a game to run at 1080p because as soon as you undock it, then basically all your UI assets and the game itself need to be kind of res rescaled or resized to fit in a 720 display. So the short answer is you have to account for both. Now, a lot of games that you'll find out there don't actually do this. They kind of have a target resolution and no matter which one it is, is, is what you'll get in both handheld and docked. And what I mean by that is there are scenarios where some games run at 720p or they max out at 720p depending on uh, whether you're playing in handheld or in docked mode. But for the most part, you have to render the game at different resolutions now the good news is the switch sdk allows you to do this in a pretty streamlined and a pretty easy way but yes it's a good question and yeah you do have to you have to kind of consider both resolutions because you don't really know how people are going to play your game so you kind of have to account for both of those scenarios next question is from the vrang 807 youtube channel how much actual coding do you do writing C++, Python, C Sharp versus interfacing with a program that would better simulate a video game? As a programmer myself, I write some code 
build it, debug any errors, and then run it as a program on the computer? Is it a similar process or different? Uh, for myself, that's pretty much my workflow as well. Uh, VRang807 YouTube channel. I basically uh, do most of my work with a uh, you know with a with a compiler, right? With a C++ compiler, Visual Studio 2019 in in this scenario. But yeah, basically, you know, write a chunk of code uh, for a particular system that you're working on or for a particular thing that you're working on, you know, debug it, test it, build it, um, and then hopefully QA will uh, pass on it. They'll do a QA pass on, on what you've done and hopefully they'll, they'll tick the box and, and sign it off. If not, they'll kick it back to you and say, hey, these things are broken, so go back and fix them type of thing. So a lot of my time is spent on actual coding. Now, I'm a developer. Um, there are other people that, that work in my team that have different roles. So, you know, we have a UI artist, we have um, someone that uh, manages the production side. We also have other people that do development, but in other parts of the applications as well. So really for myself, I'm just kind of the code monkey that just kind of writes code uh, pretty much 97% of the time. Trip and Fall asks, are the current gen consoles beefy enough to unlock the potential of Unreal Engine 5? Trip and fall, this is a good question. I think they are. Um, Unreal Engine just got a bump to 5.3 and it's slowly starting to uh, you know, take form in, in the way that we're going to start to see more UE5 games announced and released uh, on consoles over the com coming years. Obviously, there are games like Avowed and Hellblade 2 uh, that are slated as UE5 games. There's, there's games on the PlayStation 5 that are running Unreal Engine 5 as well. Of course, Fortnite. Yeah, I think UE5 is uh, is a good fit for consoles. Consoles are beefy enough. It's really, again, going back to the question about graphics and, and kind of rendering budgets. Um, it's really about the developer and what they're, what they're looking for. It's kind of their decision to determine how much rendering budget that they should allocate for the particular game that they're working on. Good question, uh, Trip and Fall. Now, Victor asks, how do you deal with a situation where you feel that gameplay decision from say a lead designer or someone just above you gets to decide things is it bad for a game granted who knows if they're wrong or you're wrong in the end but i'd be curious what kind of dialogue ensues such a situation i get this question quite a bit and this is a good one um look for me uh i think that something like uh you know making decisions on gameplay or even even anything that you're kind of working on really is a collaborative thing. I personally like to welcome feedback from anyone uh, kind of that's involved in the team. And I think that's kind of the way you should do things. Like I, I certainly have my own ways of, of thinking about how I want things to go. But I also acknowledge that, you know, I'm a I'm an old boomer and uh, there are younger people on the team that, that have very, very good ideas about what we're doing. And I think the situation where you've got a message or a direction from someone above you uh, in management, for example, those types of things we'll always take a look at. Now, whether we decide that we want to implement them is something that's really left up to the team itself. So I think ultimately, um, you know, we're very, very lucky to be in a situation where, um, you know, we do get a lot of kind of requests and, and things like that. But for the most part, the situation is I kind of, maintain that gameplay decisions and and decisions within a project itself is kind of just for the team to make those decisions to make those decisions themselves i think ultimately if you're right or wrong in the end that's something that potentially unless it's it's a a very key part of a gameplay decision that's being made um is something that potentially could be adjusted over time as well but ultimately you know, any kind of gameplay decision is kind of left up to the team. And, and it's usually the producer or the kind of the leads that, that kind of, you know, approve or decline any kind of gameplay decisions that are made. McKay Baker asks, how much of a game developer's time is strictly spent coding? Well, McKay, this is a good question. And I kind of touched on it just before, but there are many different roles when it comes to working in video games. Uh, someone like myself, like uh, as kind of I touched on previously, I write code for a living, so that's what I do. So I spend probably about 97% of my time writing code. So that's all I'm doing. 
but there are other people in teams that that all they're doing is building assets or they're building 3d models or they're rigging animations or they're doing uh you know they're creating sound effects or music or they're creating uh, art assets art assets or ui assets so it's very very difficult for me just to kind of answer that because it's 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 an kind of an overarching question when you're saying game developer but if you're talking about someone um that is strictly kind of writing you know engine programming if you will or back-end engine development then most of the time that person will be spent writing code probably about between 85 to 95 percent of their time which is what i'm doing but again i also want to be very clear that that's something that you know uh game developer means many different things to many different people so there's probably people out there that work in game development that don't write any code at all so i just kind of want to be very clear on that and that's all the questions that we have for this particular episode of Ask the Developer. If you guys have any questions that you want to ask me about video game development in any capacity, feel free to submit them to the Patreon and uh, we'll be back for episode two. And hopefully uh, we'll have some really cool questions to answer for you guys. But thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.